Good morning. Welcome to the first session today of um, the Utah State Historical Society's 69th Annual Conference. Um, our theme this year is very timely, um, Public Health and the Common Good. I'm Holly George from Utah Historical Quarterly, and we are going to wait a minute or two to let a few folks trickle in. And in the meantime, I'm going to thank our conference sponsors. Um, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, one of our sister agencies, um, our parent department, the Utah Department of Cultural and Community Engagement, and our partners and colleagues at, at um, Utah Humanities and Utah Westerners. We want to thank them very much for their sponsorship. Um, we have sessions all day today, tomorrow, and then on Friday, I really, wonderful keynote from Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens. So tune in via Zoom. Also, we're on Facebook Live. And um, with that, I think I'm going to turn the time to Jeff Turner to, to introduce our session today, which is, again, exceedingly timely and also really useful for future historians about collecting in a pandemic. So thank you, Jeff. Awesome, thank you, Holly. Um, welcome everyone to this panel entitled The COVID-19 Pandemic, Collecting and Preserving Contemporary Materials for Future Historians. Uh, I'm Jeff Turner, I'm just moderating the panel. Um, so here's the structure of what we're gonna do. I'm gonna introduce our three panelists. Sorry, that's a puppy at the door. Um, I'm going to introduce our three panelists. Um, they're going to give the presentations. We'll hold Q&A until the end because I think these projects go uh, really well together. And I'll give some comments uh, right before the Q&A. So our three panelists are Rachel Whitman, Anna Neetrauer, and Lisa Barr. Um, Anna Neetrauer is the Interim Head of Digital Library Services and Digital Initiatives Librarian at the University of Utah's J. Willard Marriott Library. In her current role, she supervises digital library programs such as digital preservation, Utah digital newspapers, digitization, and metadata. Her research interests include name authority control in digital libraries, collaborative digitization, and the intersection of digital humanities and digital libraries, and metadata community support. Rachel Whitman is the digital curation librarian, also at the University of Utah J. Willard Marriott Library. In her role, she creates metadata for digital collections, develops digital exhibits, and enjoys exploring ways to interpret metadata with data visualizations, uh, which I can attest are very good. Um, Lisa Barr is a historical collections curator for the Utah Division of State History's Library and Collections Program, overseeing its manuscript, photograph, and map collections. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in history from the University of Utah, with certificates in public history and historic preservation. So with that, we'll get rolling with Rachel and Anna's presentations. That's great, thank you, Jeff. And uh, we're going excited to talk to you today about um, the University of Utah's COVID-19 uh, digital collection, which is a unique crowdsource collection. Next slide. Here I am and here Rachel is. We are both on Twitter and um, we're joined by our silent partner who's not here today. Uh, Jeremy Minty is the other librarian who's worked on this project. Next slide. To give a little bit of background, uh, shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic started, institutions across the world started collecting projects to capture information about these unusual shared experiences. So this, for example, is a map of public history projects about COVID-19. So what we started doing in Utah was definitely um, keeping pace with the work of many other institutions. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about just framework, things that we might think about um, rapid collecting um, or rapid archiving and traumatic events. 
Um, I think this quote from Foster and Evans on their documenting Ferguson project, which started following the shooting of Michael Brown in 2014, really captures um, how uh, folks in libraries and archives um, really need to dramatically shift their thinking um, as they're collecting contemporary materials. Um, and as we were thinking about launching this collection, we knew that we were heading into it with a need to be extremely flexible. Um, and we found that not just the pandemic um, affected us in Utah, we had a lot of other events such as um, earthquakes, windstorms, um, political protests, um, and we needed to be continually flexible and have conversations about the collection as we were developing it. Next slide. Shortly after the pandemic started, um, a lot of folks in news organizations um, or library and archives organizations almost immediately started the process of thinking about um, how do we how do we document this and what is it going to look like um, for future historians? So this is just a sample of some of the headlines um, where people were in the process of thinking back about the pandemic um, as it was actually happening, which is a very unusual space to be in. Next slide. We launched uh, this project in April of 2020, um, and we developed some outreach materials directly appealing to the public to contribute to the collection. We worked with um, our marketing department at the Marriott Library to prepare materials to promote the project. And so here's an example where um, we're mentioning um, things that we're interested in capturing um, and inviting people to submit their content. Next slide. Um, right after we launched the project in April, we immediately got a lot of positive word of mouth on social media. It was a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I think um, it just happened to be that we set this project up right as people were wanting um, some good news stories about the pandemic, if that's possible. Um, and we immediately got a lot of initial attention, which really uh, contributed to an uptake in submissions for the project. Next slide. And I want to take a minute just to acknowledge um, everyone who contributed their labor to the project. People have um, commented that we got a lot of material up very quickly. And it was really due to the fact that um, we had support from our organization to quickly pivot to this work when we decided it was important. And we were able to allocate our time um, to this project. And it certainly has taken a lot of people to get us this far. And another point that I want to bring out um, is that as we were developing the collection, um, we donated items to the collection as well. So we were building the collection and donating to it at the same time, which is a little bit wacky. Um, so one photo that we included in the collection was a screenshot of one of our Zoom meetings talking about the collection, which is a bit meta. Um, and we also made some strategic choices in documenting things like panic shopping, protests, and the windstorm. So occasionally there might be a situation where um, we were thinking, oh, we, we really need more coverage of a certain topic. And if we happen to have some stuff on our cell phones, we would go ahead and donate to the collection as well. Next slide. And just to give you a sense of how we collect materials, we have a web page of the project that provides an overview. And this leads to forms where people can submit um, both stories and photos. Next slide. Here's an example of that submission form where you can see, again, we're giving that um, guidance about potential topic areas. And one thing to note about the photos and stories in the digital collection is that we assume that the creators are retaining their copyright and we're only seeking permission to um, distribute and digitally preserve what they want to share with our digital library. And now Rachel's going to provide an overview of um, how we created the collection as well as some of the interesting themes that have popped out as we've been collecting it. Okay, um, so I'm Rachel Whitman 
And before I get started, I just have to make a note to Jeff. Um, you might have to show us the puppy that's scratching at your door at some point during this presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so like Anna said, I'll be giving a brief overview of how we um, basically get from the public, public donated submission to the published collection. And I'll also be giving you a little insight into what the public donated to the Utah COVID-19 digital collection. First, I'll start with the submission process. And this is a screenshot um, of an example of what a submission looks like once we receive it within our project management system called JIRA. And this is one of Jeremy Minty's submission. He gave me permission to um, use this as an example today. Um, from this view, you can see that the form captures some basic contact information. Um, submitters can select from a list of subject categories that their content fits into. Um, submitters are also given an open text field to add descriptive um, information about what they're submitting. And we capture an electronic signature and phone number for permission purposes. And you can sort of see at the bottom of this screenshot, there's three images with this submission. There's actually five, but you can see the top three. So people can submit um, a number of items at once. And so now I'll show you um, what a published record looks like once we add all of the metadata to it. Here's a screenshot of a published record, um, which is from that same submission batch of Jeremy's. And we've created the standard metadata that's required for our digital library, which is highlighted in, in yellow. And I won't go into too much detail in all of this, but just know that we do a lot of reformatting of names, adding subject terms, putting things in the correct format. Um, for the description, we usually take whatever a submitter gives to us and put that in quotation so that's not altered. Um, and also the, um, the submitters retain their copyright for these items as well. So there is a, this is for every item that goes into the collection. So there is a bit of work on our end um, to actually get these published within the collection. So before I go into any further into highlights, of our collection. I just want to make sure everybody knows how to access the collection. This is the digital library homepage. Um, you can access that at collections.lib.utah.edu. And the best way to get to the um, the COVID-19 collection is to scroll down a little bit on the homepage. Um, you'll see a row of featured collections. And over on on the right is the Utah COVID-19 collection. There's a description there. And at the end of that um, collection description, there are the links for you to submit content to the collection. Uh, we're still in the pandemic. We're still collecting items. And um, Anna will show you more about this page later. Um, but if you click on that Utah COVID-19 in red font, it will basically pull up all of the items within the collection right now. So a couple things to note, um, we have over a thousand items in our collection, which we're really excited about. Um, there are, over on the left, there are three, um, there's some things circled. There are three components to this collection. There was a photography project, a written history project, um, and also an oral history segment. So if you click on any of the red front, you can browse those particular segments of the collection. There's also some other ways to facet and browse the collection based on keywords, subjects, terms, and also um, geographic metadata as well. So we tried to take a look like uh, digging into the content of the collection to highlight some content themes. Um, first, I'll just mention those, those three segments again. Photographs is definitely the largest portion of the collection in terms of items, um, which makes sense because we all have smartphones and documenting our daily life is just you know, normal behavior for us. So it's easy to take pictures um, and submit those to the collection at a later point. Written story, stories and oral histories definitely take um, some more thoughts and work to actually um, submit. And Anna will be getting into our oral history project in a little bit. But just looking at the photographs collection, we tried to analyze the content to pull out any themes. And there are definitely some, um, you know, major themes that we knew would be there, like masks, supermarkets, video conferencing, libraries, because we documented a lot of um, projects and social distance measures within our libraries and other libraries as well. 
Um, one thing we didn't expect to see was um, mannequins, which I'll get into in a little bit. There were a number of submissions with um, social simulations with mannequins because we were in quarantine times. Um, but I will now take you through um, some of the highlights of the collection and definitely what we think could be relevant um, could be of importance to future researchers. Okay. So panic buying. I think um, in the beginning of the pande pandemic, the content that we received really mirrored the changes in daily life that the public was experiencing. And empty shelves are definitely not something that we're used to um, seeing. So empty, here we have um, empty toilet paper shelves, the soup aisle is empty, and the hand sanitizer and um, hand soap aisle is empty as well. This was shocking for a lot of people. So we have a lot of documentation of panic buying and, and supplies running out. Um, having to wear a mask at the grocery store was a, a new experience at the beginning of the pandemic. So people were documenting what it was like to go to the store and having to mask up and also waiting in lines um, to enter the grocery store and staying six feet, of, feet apart from each other um, for social distance measures as well was, was very new a year and a half ago. Um, considering most of us were confined to our homes and limiting our social interactions, especially in enclosed spaces, outdoor recreation became a very popular theme during the pandemic and many turned to outdoor recreation. In fact, um, the Salt Lake City closed a number of streets to encourage people to get out and walk more. Um, so here we have, you know, a family on a hike and one of those street closures on the left. Um, many events turned to outdoors as well for more fresh air and space. Here is um, a neighborhood block party. Both of these pictures are from the same event where an outdoor um, dance performance was viewed by the entire block, which is pretty cool. And that'll be neat to have in the collection. Um, as always, despite these overwhelming and stressful times, people coped with the pandemic with creativity and humor. So I mentioned earlier, there's a surprising number of submissions with mannequins in the collection, um, which is people simulating human interaction. One submitter created a whole series of herself and her mannequin, Betty, which were posed in various stay-at-home activities, which we definitely re recommend checking out. Um, some of the more humorous posts include a mother and daughter hugging with the safety precautions of a sheet between them. And as far as we know, the CDC never approved of, of this, but so don't try that at home. But it was definitely um, something comical to add to um, a pretty you know, stressful time. The pandemic dramatically changed the academic experience from online classes to graduation. So here on the left, we have a completely virtual commencement ceremony um, from the Entertainment Arts and Engineering Master's Program. And on the right, you can see that band practice was also enforcing masks and social distance as well at the U. The Marriott Library led several initiatives that were both vital to the campus and the medical community. In the beginning of the pandemic, when supplies were in short supply, our 3D printers were used to make PPE facial components for healthcare workers. The Marriott Library was also awarded a $1.4 million um, um, fund through the CARES Act to expand technology and lending services. Um, acquiring and lending laptops, which is pictured at the right, to students for distance education purposes was a huge part of this effort. And not pictured here, we do have a lot of documentation of social distance measures within the Marriott Library, so at the circulation desk and closing off staff stacks in different um, se sections of the library. So 2020, um, an unprecedented year in many regards, and there were a lot of number of historical events that coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these experiences impacted each other and therefore we welcomed them into the collection. Um, there were a number of mass protests around the country, especially in Salt Lake City in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and in opposition to it as well. So during, and also during the most intense political election year in recent memory, um, the University of Utah hosted the vice presidential debate, which we have some pictures of the outside as well. Most of us will never forget the first week of the pandemic in Salt Lake City where there was a significant earthquake while we were all sheltering at home um, and many aftershocks that rattled us. So 
while we don't have a lot of images of destruction, we do have some um, preparedness kits over on the left. The family was getting ready in case there were some more aftershocks or earthquakes that happened. Uh, we also have quite a bit of documentation of the windstorm that hit Salt Lake City um, as well. We were very happy to get to the vaccination section of the collection where we have um, documentation of some of the vaccination, the larger operation vaccination centers um, around the state, state and what a massive um, effort it has been to roll out the vaccinations. And not to leave out the 85 written stories in the collection, um, although they represent a smaller portion of the submissions, we've been able to capture some poignant reflections and anecdotes. So the interest of time, I'll just focus on the student submissions. So we've received quite a few from students, um, also high school students who were particularly upset that they wouldn't return to class for their senior year. Um, we also had a large portion of Uni University of Utah students submit stories since several faculty incorporated submissions into their curriculum. One of these quotes resonates really strongly, um, which is most students at the University of Utah will long remember their spring break, but not because of what they did or because it was extended, rather because this was a turning point in the world, which is very true. And now Anna will tell you more about the oral history component of this um, project and how you can contribute to the collection. Thanks very much. Uh, so one of the really reward re rewarding aspects of this collection, and this uh, came after the collection had been um, developed for quite some time, is work with born digital um, oral histories. So um, somebody might do a Zoom interview and produce a transcript, um, just you know, as they would in a sort of traditional oral history. And um, unlike the rest of the collection, these are not crowdsourced. These are developed with direct partnerships uh, with University of Utah faculty and their students. And these items are formally donated to Marriott Library Special Collections. So the person who um, started us off on this endeavor was uh, Gretchen Case, who was presenting yesterday um, as part of a plenary session. Um, and she has some incredibly valuable oral histories that focus on uh, the one on the screen up here, focuses on the patient experience um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and additional complications um, as a result of just the, the burden it's placing on um, the medical community and as well as direct interviews with uh, physicians um, up at the University of Utah Hospital. Um, in addition to this, we've had a number of uh, history classes, undergraduate experience classes also have their students uh, develop uh, oral histories as part of class assignments. And I'm going to just uh, pull out a couple quotes from some of those uh, highlighted items right now. Next slide. So in terms of um, taking a look at the medical community, here's a, a great quote from an interview um, conducted by um, a University of Utah student um, where they were interviewing um, a doctor actually in New York. Um, we didn't decide to be prescriptive about uh, the geographical coverage for oral histories if the common thread was a University of Utah student or someone affiliated with the University of Utah doing the oral history, um, we, we will take everything and and here's um, a really powerful quote from a doctor, you know, just talking about the the levels of risk um, and and how, you know, he just kind of kept on going um, even, you know, with limited PPE and all of the the issues at the early stages of the pandemic next slide um it's been really interesting seeing uh how um some of the students doing these oral histories will focus on topics or themes and so in the collection of oral histories um there are there's a lot of focus on teachers uh adjusting to um, teaching in social distance um, in different ways, 
as well as focus on people who are parenting children with special needs throughout the pandemic and how um, their educational experiences were affected by this. And so this is a, a quote that I think um, anybody who, you know, knows some kids in the educational system can relate to um, where the teacher is bringing forward the issue that um, if students were really supported by their parents, they seem to do okay. But um, if they were not getting that kind of extra help at home, people were really struggling with the online format and, and just her frustration with that. Um, so I encourage you to check out some of these oral histories later on. And next slide. Um, I would love that to say that we've uh, closed our submissions um, because the pandemic is over, but that's definitely not the case and we're still taking submissions. Um, so if you have some interesting stories or photos that you would like to consider submitting or if you know of people who had some unique experiences that you think should be um, preserved for the future, um, please take a look at our project and consider submitting them. And now we'll turn it over to Lisa to talk about her exciting project as well. All right, thanks for having me today. And I'm gonna talk about Utah Division of State History's K-12 COVID-19 Memory Project. And this image that you'll see in front of you is a submission from a student who took photos of all of her family members um, wearing masks, including her dogs. And this is another example like Rachel and Anna um, mentioned of people trying to make the most of and finding some humor uh, during the pandemic. So first I'd like to go over why we decided to focus on K-12 learners. Our team had a meeting in April of 2020 to discuss what we should be collecting during the pandemic and a colleague suggested something that K-12 learners could participate in. So then I met with our History Day coordinator, Wendy Atset, and we developed elementary, junior high, and high school specific questionnaires for students to fill out and submit for a permanent collection that will be housed with the Historical Society. And the questions focus on school, extracurricular activities, family and home life, and society. And my favorite part of this project is that students are analyzing primary sources in their history and social studies classes. And this gives them an opportunity to create their own primary source, which helps them connect to personally connect to why history and documenting history matters. So, um, you can find the questionnaires on our K-12 resources page on State History's website um, under the COVID-19 Memory Project. Oh, sorry. And it will take you to this page, which gives a description of the project. And here's where you can download um, the questionnaires um, based on age groups. And this is a questionnaire template. So students fill these out and then they there is a, um, a a donation agreement that their parents or guardians need to fill out and, and sign, and then they email them directly to me. And so now I'm gonna take the opportunity just to share um, some questions and answers from students that I kind of picked out by random um, throughout the collection. So the majority of the submissions came, came in from the first few months of the pandemic um, when schools were shut down and students were getting used to online learning and quarantine. Um, we've received over 300 submissions, and they range from all over the Wasatch Front to Southern Utah and Eastern Utah as well. So now I'm just going to go through and, and read some of the examples. So this is about school life. How did you feel when you learned that schools closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic? I was sad because school is the only way I get to see, and to see and contact some of my friends. At first, I was kind of excited because I get to stay in pajamas sometimes for school, but I don't like it that much anymore. And how are you connecting with friends during the pandemic? We FaceTime and see each other during church Zoom church activities. Sometimes we hang out in someone's backyard and stay six feet apart in lawn chairs. We also do a scavenger hunt where one person hides a box in the neighborhood along with clues and, and see who can first find the treasure. And then we add things to the box. And extracurricular activities. 
What do you miss about doing activities in person? I miss my friends and having the space of the dance studio. It brings me joy to be there because dance is how I express my feelings. I've had to convert my living room into a dance room. I also miss my teachers giving me specific instructions. What do you like about doing online activities? I like doing new things the coaches have created to make doing, uh, doing dry Zoom meetings fun, such as quarantine go cards and relays with other teammates on Zoom. And these are about society. Um, and these were more directed toward like, I'd say high school students. Um, how has the pandemic affected your community and how has it affected your state? I'm a little worried about the economy with people losing their jobs. Um, and I do, I do feel like the state has been affected by not having so much air pollution due to not so many cars on the road. And what do you want future generations to know about what it's like to experience the pandemic? I want them to know that sometimes it may feel hopeless and desperate, that these feelings, but these feelings are normal. And I want future generations to acknowledge those feelings because those don't make you weak, they make you human. I want them to know that in experience of pandemic, they're going to go through lots of ups and downs, but in the long run, everything is going to be all right. And I just realized I skipped a slide. So let me go back to family and home life. So what has changed most in your home because of the pandemic? I have more chores to do and more responsibility to help my mom out so she works full time. My parents have still been able to work luckily, but my siblings are home all day and we fight with each other because there's no place to flee to. Some families are bonding, but ours is desperate for personal space. And how do you stay connected uh, to extended family and how has this changed your relationships? I have FaceTimed my grandparents a few times so far. We see them around four times a year, so it isn't a big change. However, we're able to, we weren't able to visit them over spring break this year. At the beginning of this, I was sending Marco Polo back and forth with my cousins I'm closest to, and I had a cousin born during this time, so I haven't been able to see my new cousin. All right, and then some students um, created their own digital journals um, that they submitted as well. And then here's just one journal entry that I think is great. Oh, sorry. The weather is, uh, the weather is crazy. Yesterday was warm and sunny today is snowing pretty hard. Playing outside is something, it's not something I'm gonna do very much. Today we'll have a lot of time reading and playing inside with my brothers and sisters. I will probably watch the ultimate Beastmaster on. I know that the virus is air, is an airborne virus, but I want to know how it spreads and how close and how close you have to be to someone with the virus to get it. If someone in the store touches something and then puts it down, they have to, and they have the virus, someone picks up to get it. I know that I know that much of this virus is unknown, but um, but is there a cure coming out? Are people working on a cure? Fear drives, lots of things. This is why people are buying so much toilet paper. It bears spreading much faster than the virus. And that alone is dangerous. If some people need toilet paper, um, some people need toilet paper. There's none at the store. This is a big problem. I hope that people will come together and help people that are in need. And I just really love this one because this, this kid is really, his reflection is just, I think, head on like for, you know, for what I think we're all experiencing. And so students also submitted images um, of how they're spending quarantine with their family. And the students shared um, images of outdoor movie night and going on hikes with their family and then also Zooming with their family. And here are a few other images. One is from a student who did some artwork in their, in their window. And another is a student who found this awesome street art um, COVID related street art that they took a photograph of. And I also, finally, I wanted to bring up the, the, you are the, you are the primary source. Um, ah, sorry guys. Um, digital initiatives. Uh, the collaboration is, is from made by us in the International Federation of Public History and, uh, the Marriott Library and Division of State Histories collections are included in here. And I just think it is an awesome resource. And then finally, our collection isn't available yet. We're currently processing it right now. Um, we are, I'm a team of one, and we have one digitization person. So she and I are working on it right now, but we're still continuing to take submissions throughout the pandemic. And just please contact me if you have any questions. So thank you. Great. Thanks for those uh, presentations. I'll give a few comments right now and then we'll open it up for um, Q&A. So I wanna 
thank Anna, Rachel, and Lisa for the work in these projects and for their compelling presentations. I think they adeptly show the construction of different archives and the collection of various media that convey experiences during the pandemic. In doing so, I think they've had to ask, what's in a pandemic and what history can be made here? These are difficult questions to answer. The more they're even more difficult to build projects around. So just um, kudos for the, the scope and the gravitas of the projects. It's fitting, I think, that these projects and others across the country like them grow from vast and incomprehensible social disruption. Communications theorist Emmett uh, Pinchevsky writes, quote, it is not by chance that the elusive nature of trauma, for us world trauma, so it's not by chance that the elusive nature of world trauma, it's teetering between past and present, presence and absence, proximate and distant, is often made manifest by means of media technology. Media constitute the material conditions for trauma to appear as something that cannot be fully approached and yet somehow must be. The Utah K-12 COVID-19 Memory Project and the Utah COVID-19 Digital Collection Project are living, breathing, human efforts to do precisely that, to approach a moment that cannot be fully approached in no small part, because in some ways we still live in the confines of, of a pandemic, ever ending and ever continuing. These projects provide the digital media through the contents of submissions and the forms of archives that carry the experiences of people within a pandemic that is itself past and present, present and absent, proximate and distant. The unique ambition of these projects is to capture snapshots of a thing as it is in process, which in turn contributes to the ways that these projects too are themselves in process and the ways that they continue to live and adapt. Pinchevsky continues, if the traumatic condition is such that it escapes ordinary cognizance, media provide alternative channels to encompass it precisely as such. Media bear witness to the human failure to bear witness, and in doing so, render the traumatic tangible by means of technological reproduction. These two COVID projects bridge us in a moment of fractured isolation. They document our diverse presence, and in doing so, bridge us with those in the future by providing them with now usable pasts. This to me seems precisely like history. Through primary sources, his historians interpret human experience that quote, escapes ordinary cognizance, both in context and throughout time, a cognizance that these projects strive to witness. Yet archives themselves are limited by things like resources, rules, and acquisitions. It would be foolhardy to expect these projects to portray the whole of human experiences during this pandemic, just as it would be foolhardy to expect any archive to portray the whole of any past moment. So I'd love to turn our attention to the media that do not bear witness to the human failure to bear witness, or the ways that media might not make their way into either project. What kinds of submissions did you expect to see but did not? What submissions did you see but not expect? Maybe mannequins are a great example of that. Um, were there examples of submissions that you had to exclude for one reason or another? And what are, what are the, you know, the rules that sort of led to those decisions? Did you adapt your project structures to include some of these submissions over time? Um, when might these projects stop? These questions, I think, imply the contingent nature of these projects in a present that has not passed and that provides different futures of possible ends, a unique opportunity that reflects the depth of their undertakings. So those are just my, my initial forays. Um, I'm happy to repeat the questions uh, for you panelists, but with those questions, I'll end my comments, uh, although I have lots more and many more questions. Um, and we'll have about 20 minutes of um, Q&A from our Zoom audience. Uh, in the meantime, let's give a hearty thanks to Anna, Rachel, and Lisa for their ambitious, ambitious projects and their incisive presentations. So um, if anyone wants to tackle um, any questions about um, stuff that you excluded, stuff that you expected to see but didn't, um, how your projects have changed over time in response to their sort of ongoing natures, um, and then we'll see what the chat has. Uh, I can start if that's okay with everyone. Um, with the, the Utah COVID-19 digital collection, um, all of our, a lot of our discussions have been centered on expanding the project. Um, I will say 
um, and I'm probably the only one on the team, at first, I didn't want to do it at all. And then I changed my mind, um, and I thought, yeah, this, this is important, and we should do it. Um, and we initially were thinking that we just needed photographs, and then we were like, oh, we've got to get stories too. And then, um, and then we were contacted about doing some oral histories. And then I was like, oh, we've got to get in the business of Zoom oral histories, which is a new thing. So I think um, one hallmark of the collection is that we've been um, expanding the type of formats that we've been accepting um, all along. I think um, in terms of things that are missing from the collection, we do not have a lot of geographic diversity. We're, we're mostly getting things from around Salt Lake. Um, we are not, also do not have a lot of um, folks from like underrepresented populations in the collection. Um, what were some of your other questions that I'm, I'm leaving out? I think I think you got most of them. <laughs> okay, then I'll I'll I will stop for now, and then everyone else can chime in. I think your question, um, Jeff, about uh, did we like not accept some collections? And sometimes there was very few instances where if someone just sent like a selfie, we tried we tried to have at least you know some sort of image that captured some sort of action or something related to the pandemic so that was you know that was kind of one instance where we were trying to draw the line of of what we were actually accepting like it had to have some proof of something pandemic related um to the collection. And I also, you know, in the document, the images that I kind of briefly went through, they're definitely just a small snippet of the collection. Um, I didn't really get into some of the more emotionally difficult ones. Um, we do have some, um, a small number of submissions from like a distance, social distance funeral, um, people quarantining at home, some really stressful situations. Um, we do have one screenshot. There's a web memorial for people who did lose their life to COVID. Um, so we have like a screenshot of that and a link to it, but we don't have a lot of um, stories of, you know, people who did um, lose their, their lives or have been compromised from COVID-19. Um, I'd say the biggest barrier for us um, when it comes to not accepting submissions was since they're minors, um, they need a waiver. And sometimes it's not easy for kids to get their parents to sign things, you know, like every, every family is different, you know, and parents are busy. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons, you know, so sometimes students would submit them and I'd have to send them back and say, hey, just can you get this signed, you know, so you know, that's unfortunate. It just kind of speaks to, you know, how some parents, some families can be around for their students more than others for a variety of reasons. Um, and we, another barrier I'd say is, so we also had these translated to Spanish, the questionnaires and we, but we haven't had any submissions yet. Um, so that still speaks to a barrier. Um, so Wendy, um, when we did this, what we first did is Wendy um, sent these out to social, social studies teachers in her network and they kind of spread them out. And that's when we got the most submissions. Um, and since they're public school students, you know, there's kind of a more equal playing field, but they're still, they still need their families to participate in it. Um, so, so I'd say that'd be the most difficult part of it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it looks like, as far as I can tell, that we don't have any Q&As from the audience yet. So I get to run with my questions, which I'm very excited about. Um, I, I know that both of your projects are sort of uh, in a, a swath of national projects, at least I'm aware of a national context for these projects. I'm just curious, um, what are, are, are there any ways, um, or not, totally fine too, um, that your projects sort of showed regionality? I mean, like what's unique about Utah? What's what's um, represented about Utah in the space? I mean, it seems to me like hiking is one really big aspect of that, right? Um, and, and maybe some other some other stuff that I don't know about, but you know, it, it seems like there's there's something unique um, to contribute or, or not about these collection pro projects in terms of region. Uh, Utah was number one for panic shopping. So I, I feel like uh, the sheer volume of pictures of empty grocery uh, store shelves, uh, that's unique to Utah. Um, 
as well as the the outdoor recreation aspect um, that you mentioned. I think those are some of the uniquely Utah things. I think also the natural disasters that were uniquely Utah during this time period um, also sort of capture something that was unique to the region um, and just the idea of being in a pandemic and then experiencing an earthquake at the same time. I mean, that's kind of mind blowing. Um, the trees going down was insane. Um, so I hope that, I hope that uh, that'll be useful for people when they're trying to look back and, and see what the experience was like in Utah, that all this other stuff was happening at the same time. Yeah, we can't forget the windstorm too that happened all within that. So yeah, I, I agree with, with Anna that the outdoor recreation um, was a very, a very big theme, especially in images um, and also just like getting outside just everyone. But I think this actually isn't really, this is probably a national thing where everyone's taking more walks and taking more walks with their families. Um, if anything, I saw more you know, national themes than anything that's like specific to Utah. I think it just felt very well in the national narrative of what's going on. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, the question is, has the tone of submissions changed from fear and panic to annoyance um, would be what uh, this, this audience member expects. So has the tone of submissions changed? Uh, I think it's hard to say, especially because we were kind of front loaded with a lot of submissions at the beginning of the pandemic. And then it um, sort of slowed down a little bit, which maybe that's an indication of that, you know, the level of interest. I think the annoyance right now is just people not submitting. <laughs> like that's where we're, it's not really annoyance. I think it's burnout. Um, probably more than anything. Like we don't have any documentation of the drought, for example, um, which could also be folded into a regional um, weather occurrence that we could include in the collection and the reopening of campuses as well. So I think people are burnt out a bit. Yeah, same, same with ours. We were really front loaded in the first few months and over the summer, um, and then we got we got another kind of wave in fall of 2020 when students were going back to school. So you kind of saw the difference of because school did change between you know March of that you know of the 2020 school year to September because kids were actually back in school and dealing dealing with masks and all that and navigating that. So there's differences in there, um, but it's been pretty quiet. Um, I've still had some submissions triple in, but in 2021, I think it's been quiet because I think people are burnt out. That's just, you know, this is anecdotal. This is just what I think and maybe how I feel too, that maybe people just don't want to talk about it as much anymore because um, of burnout, so. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's maybe do these uh, most recent first. So. Um, related to that, are you picking up uh, COVID or vaccine denial and protest as a part of your collections? I think there's been um, a little bit of that picked up in some of the oral histories that some of the University of Utah students have done, but I can't say that we've formally gone to um, anti-masking events uh, to document them. Um, so I think we've got a little bit of that. Yeah, same here. We haven't received any donations, um, but we also haven't been out there actively collecting either. Um, but I think it's something that is definitely worthwhile to collect. You need to see, we need to document all sides of this and the pandemic has been politicized and it needs to be documented. Yeah, we definitely welcome that if anybody has documentation of it to contribute it to the collection. Great, thank you. And another question, um, are you collecting local news articles or official reporting on the pandemic? Uh, we are not, we are collecting through um, University of Utah Special Collections does have a web archiving program and that is collecting 
the University of Utah related communication around the pandemic. Um, so that's that's something that's more in our scope than um, doing that kind of work with uh, official reports. Yeah, same here. We haven't ac actively been collecting that. Um, we're open to submissions if people are collecting that kind of material to create that kind of collection, but we have not been actively collecting. Great. I think, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I was really curious about, um, it seems like this project had, or these projects have such interesting starts and ends. Um, like, it seems like there's kind of a clear impetus to start and collect and like, you know, document in a moment where documentation looks totally different because like, you know, social interactions look totally different. Um, but like, I'm, I'm really curious, like, what does the end look like? Like, is there is there some going to be some like official pronouncement, the pandemic is over, and that's when your projects end? I mean, like, is it going to be like, are there going to be afterlives about collecting recollections of the pandemic? You know, it, I'm, I'm really curious about about the end, because that's like such a, such a hard thing to parse out in society more broadly in this moment. I mean, for some people, the pandemic has ended. And for some people, it's very much alive, right? Um, so, so yeah, what does, what does the end of your projects look like? Uh, I would love I think to about that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, okay. I, I think about that a lot, a lot too, like what, when is going to end, you know, it's like we're taking submissions until the pandemic ends, but what does that look like? And I also think, you know, we missed an opportunity. I, I was on Twitter a couple months ago and I saw that like people were, you know, collecting teachers experiences and I'm like, why didn't we do that? You know, um, and I think it's just because we were so quick. We're just like focusing on the students and we were so quick. Like we got to get this out before the school year ends that, you know, I love to go back and like do some more like, you know, oral history, you know, reflections on the pandemic once it's over or maybe at least a little more distant. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly think about that every day. Um, you know, like when is this over and then how can you start reflecting in a different way about it? Yeah, um, I would love for there to be an official announcement, and I wish that that would happen like in the next two weeks. I would like an announcement that the pandemic is over, and then we could just uh, shut it down. And I think I I definitely agree with um, with Lisa that I think that oral histories um, can be a great way to sort of signal that shift. And with the oral histories that we have, where people are reflecting on the early part of the pandemic. And I hope we get some in the future, five years out, 10 years out, um, where people will have had the opportunity to um, place things in a more of a broader context. So it might be that this um, these projects never end and we'll be adding to them, you know, in some fashion, um, you know, and I guess that's okay, even though I, I really wish, uh, we could be at that point where we're just looking back on it. Uh, and also, I'm just really curious, um, how did your projects really start? Like, did it start with like one person suggesting thing? Was it like a group collaborative communication? Um, Anna, you mentioned having institutional support really quickly and everybody sort of devoting lots of labor. And Lisa, it sounds like it's like, a little bit uh, more laden on you in terms of labor. I'm just curious, like what, what did the starts of these projects look like? Uh, Rachel sent an email. That's how our project started. So Rachel sent an email saying, I think we should do this. And then <laughs> and then we decided to. So, um, and, and we had some structures and workflows in place for sort of crowdsourced collections um, already. Um, so we did not have to reinvent our um sort of internal ticketing and processing system that we use for all of these submissions so having that framework in place definitely uh allowed us to get up and running fast is there anything you would add to that rachel or i mean i i think at the time we when we came up with the idea we were trying to we already had the infrastructure in place to crowdsource collections and we were like what should we do next and it was like literally like the first or second week of the pandemic so it was a pretty obvious like signal and uh yeah coming up the idea was really easy i think you know anna and jeremy jumping into action and getting to general counsel getting the permissions getting all of that the system set up was the really heavy lifting uh for getting things in place so ours started, honestly, it was 
it started because of the Marriott. They were just so quick to it. And we're just like, oh my gosh, they're doing like this great work. And like, we need to collect, but what should we collect? Cause we also were conscious of not overlapping like scopes too, you know, it, ideally with like, with archiving, it's better to have like certain themes and materials just all in one place for the user. So they're not having to go all over the place to do research. Um, and so our collections team, we just had a meeting um, talking about like, what should we collect? Are there themes? And a colleague talked about K-12, a K-12 project. And we work closely with um, Wendy um, from History Day. And so, you know, like a couple days later, she and I had a meeting about what was the best way to go about it. And so that's how we thought of the questionnaires. And we just tried to form it in a way that's accessible to students. And we, we got them up on the website in about a week. And then she sent them out to her, her network of, of educators. Great. Um, and I think my, I have a, a few more questions, but I'll, I'll end on this one because um, I don't want to take up all the time. Um, but what have you, like, are you going to take away anything in terms of the form of these projects for future projects? What have you learned about, you know, gathering, um, co gathering collections for an archive? And, and has this changed the way that you're going to sort of iterate through, through future versions of, of collecting, collecting documents? Uh, we are getting into born digital oral histories in a big way, not just for this uh, collection. Um, there are still a lot of implications and unknowns about that in terms of long-term digital preservation with things that are submitted in kind of lossy file formats. Um, those are some pretty complex issues that are, um, I think gonna, we're gonna have to have a lot of conversations about within our institution. Um, but we're also eager to sort of expand our oral histories to include um, contributions from University of Utah faculty and students in this way. Um, and that's really exciting. And that's something that's not um, unique just to this project, but it's going to continue on for other projects. And we've already started to work with um, Born Digital Oral Histories outside the context of COVID. And here at State History, I can see us um, using like a questionnaire format. I mean, these are pretty much oral histories. And this is just using a simple questionnaire and sending it out to the public. Um, it's just a great way, a great accessible way for the public to participate in history collecting. Um, so I can see us doing stuff like, you know, questionnaires more um, and sending them out to the public. And I would love to do more oral histories. Um, I don't know what that's gonna look like. I got that's something I have to talk to Holly and Jed about and I don't want like scare them like I have all these plans and you know um but I think that is the best route to go um like what Anna was saying yeah it seems like uh, both of your projects capture different like age groups it'd be really interesting to sort of compare and contrast you know the, the stuff that you find or the, or the collections that you end up end up creating um in terms of the stories that people tell especially since you you're basically both doing oral histories as well. So I think that would be, that'd be really cool. I think they'll be, they'll be on the same repository. So it'll also be easier for researchers to search across awesome. both collections. So as, as things come online, I think that'll be um, great for people to get that sort of wider context on both projects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Marriott houses all of State History's um, digital collections. So that will be a great resource for all of this. And I will say too, one of the, I feel like one of the successes of our project really was dependent on our outreach early on. So getting, uh, making sure we reach our right audience. So we were featured in a couple um, local news outlets, but just making sure you are able to publicize and promote uh, the call for action to the right audience in the beginning was definitely crucial for us. Totally. Great. Well, thank you all for um, this invigorating panel. I want to congratulate you on your projects. I think they're amazing, obviously, but I'm biased. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending and, and interacting and asking questions. Um, so kudos to everyone all around. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, thank you all for attending. I just 
I want to emphasize also just the value of this collection, you know, or collections. My, my great grandmother died in the pandemic, the flu pandemic, and we've got like two scraps on it, you know, so this is, this is a great service. Congratulations. Um, thank you to everyone for attending and for uh, submitting questions. Really appreciate it. Okay. All right, everyone take care. We'll see you at the next, the next show. <laughs> bye bye.